My name is Ken Dracknick. I'm with uh, Dell, but the Dell software side of the house. Uh, I don't know if it, people know, but Dell has a software organization, about 2,000 people strong. Most of the software group is it located in the San Francisco Bay Area, where Dell has done a number of acquisitions of companies ranging from systems management to uh, uh, network management and to things like storage and storage management types of things. So I'm from a subsidiary called Dell Case, which focuses on systems management technologies, managing both hardware and, and software systems within uh, basically laptops, desktops, servers, and now mobile devices. And so what I'm going to talk about today is some of the forces driving change mobility. Like, you know, how did we get here? What's mobility meaning to us? How, how is it changing the way that, that we work? How is it changing the way that our customers are working? And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the journey to MDM. How did we get here? Ten years ago, nobody had an iPhone, right? They hadn't been invented yet. And now they're ubiquitous. They seem to be everywhere. And then finally, the last kind of third is going to be where do we want to be? Where is mobile technology taking us? And then how are we going to manage these systems and devices going forward? And how are we going to ensure the security of our data and our assets while still making them accessible for the people who need to get to them? I started my career at, uh, in, in the wireless space at, uh, at uh, AvantGo. How many people used to have Palm Pilots? Remember AvantGo synchronizing data to Palm Pilots, right? That was 2000, right? 13 years ago. Well, it was all about the technology. Part of our, of our uh, company's uh, technology we had was a mobile workforce management application. So we had a mobile platform on which you could develop customized applications of which you could then, if you bought a proprietary SLED modem, you could get 300 baud access, wireless access, if you had one of the very rare data plants at those times, and get wireless access to a mobile application back to your enterprise. It was all about individual, unique pockets of technology, and it was all about technology. And we sold the server for $200,000, and it was $1,000 a seat to license that technology to run on your Palm Pilot that you had at that time. We eventually were sold because that, that model did not work particularly well. And 10 years later, we're now at a point where that technology is behind the curtains. We never think about that anymore. We buy a data plan, we buy a device, they all work. Uh, connectivity and data is seamless. We get it everywhere we need to go. So the idea of the focus on the technology is no longer where we have to worry, especially as IT people, but we have to worry about the impact on the business. And there are three different folks that we really have to satisfy. The CEO is worried about how do I make people uh, productive and profitable. And as Roger talked in a, in a talk earlier this morning, if people have access to many of their work assets on their mobile devices, they work about 10% more over the course of the year than they normally would. That's great for the CEO. The CIO and IT staff pull their hair out. What am I going to do with all these new devices coming in? How am I going to handle these? How do I secure the data? You're not giving me extra people. What do I do in terms of establishing policies and uh, uh, security uh, profiles to prevent the data that we consider very important to our organization from leaking out somewhere else? And finally, you have the employees who come in and say, I don't care. I've got this great device. I want to use this. And I will find a way around your security policy. So I really don't care what you do to me. I still need to use this device. And if you don't let me use the device here, I'm going to go to a different company that will let me use this device. Right? So part of it's about hiring as well. So what happens is you've got these forces coming together with the rise of social media. People live on their phones. They live on their devices. You've got this blurring of work time and home time. You know, I know I work from home a couple of days a week, and then most of the times I'll get home, have dinner, do some with the kids, then work in the evening. So that blurs what I do with my particular device. When I boot up my laptop at home, my Dell computer, it says, this is intended for work only. Do not do any personal you know, computing on this particular computer. It's like, right, it, I'm at home. It's 10 o'clock at night. Of course I'm going to use it for some personal computing. I will look up on Gmail and do something there. The emergence of these new mobile devices, there's lots of different kinds of mobile devices, many different form factors. And one of the things I want to emphasize is we don't care about that. What you care about is the operating system. right? Mobile devices come in many shapes. They're now 7-inch tablets, 9-inch tablets tablets, which are five-inch phones that are also tablets, it doesn't matter what the form factor is. What matters is what operating system that device runs, because that's what enables you to secure that particular device and make sure that whoever is using it has appropriate access to the appropriate applications they're looking for. So I know we get all focused on the particular hardware, but it's really about the operating system. And finally, with all the new employees coming in, they're changing their expectation of IT. They see I, they, they have 
owned a device for a long period of time that they want to use, and they are IT for that particular device, right? They manage their own device. And so they expect IT to manage part of that device or give them access to applications. But for much of the management of a mobile device or a device they bring in, it's their personal device and, and their IT. How many people manage their parents' computers today, right? I, my mother's 88. She's here in Sacramento. Uh, I'm in the Bay Area, and my mother clicks on every single thing that comes up, especially if it says free, right? So I have to figure out some way to manage her PC from a remote location and be able to get rid of, you know, the free software, the free virus bar that she downloaded and things like that. Multiply that by thousands of people within an organization, and now you add the complexity of these new mobile operating systems, in particular iOS and Android, where people have those on their devices, and you start to understand how big this problem can be for the poor IT guy. So, we all know who Emma Watson is. She was born in April of 1990, and I think she was 13 when she was Hermione in uh, Harry Potter, right? Really annoying character, I can understand why I had a 13-year-old daughter one time. About that same time, a guy named Tim Berners-Lee demonstrated this concept called the World Wide Web, and that happened in December of 1990. You now go forward to 2013, we're now at a point where she has grown up with the internet all her life, right? And so I use her as a metaphor for the kind of employee that's entering the workforce today. They were born with the internet, they got their first cell phone at 12 or 13, she probably got her first tablet at 19, 19, 20 maybe, is about when tablets started to become widespread. So she has known access to data on the internet her entire life. So you just hired her, she comes in on day one, how many, give, how many of you give your new employees the hottest, shiniest new laptop that the company has? Any of you? Nobody does. They get the three-year-old piece of junk that Joe had when he quit that still has all of his videos and, and pictures and you know, pictures of his dogs and horses on it. So she comes in and she looks at you the way my dog often looks at me when I do something strange, kind of hocks her head and says, why am I going to use this piece of junk laptop you just gave me that someone else used when I have this mobile device? that's vastly more powerful, has all of my personal life on it, and I know that I can connect to many of your business applications on this device. And you as at IT are now fixed, you know, facing that problem of how do I fix this, right? How do I balance the tension between my need to enable her to work and get access to information, and, or her need to do that, and my need to secure that data so it doesn't go and end up on Facebook somewhere. So I'll refer back to her kind of throughout the talk in terms of this is Generation Y and this is their expectation. And it's almost a little bit of a battle between IT management and them. Gartner in uh, last year did a, an analysis, they do kind of a poll of CIOs every year to understand what their priorities are. And their prior priorities right now have been analytics and business intelligence, right? How do they understand what's going on with their networks, who's using what, and how do they make it more efficient? Mobile technologies has come from number 12 or 13 just in the past couple of years to be number two. That's kind of the most important thing to them. And then finally, cloud computing, uh, infrastructure as a service, applications as a service, software as a service, those kinds of things. So it's fundamentally how do they offload much of the work they're doing today and either outsource that or reduce some of their, 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 op, their capital costs and make those more OpEx costs. When we go and talk to people as case, CIOs look at us and they have three questions. They said, can you help me with virtualization? Because virtualization helps me uh, manage my network much more efficiently, manage my applications much more efficiently. They ask us again about mobile technologies. How do I manage devices? How do I manage applications? How do I manage operating systems? And how do I manage security on those devices? And finally, they ask us, how can I outsource my service desk? I don't want to hire people and have them dedicated to a service desk uh, all the time. I'd like that to be outsourced. I'd like that to be as software as a service. We can't help with the third one, but we can certainly help them uh, with the first two. This is uh, from 2005 to 2013, if you can't read the bottom scale of this, are the Google search trends for the term BYOD, right? Bring your own device, bring your own laptop, bring your own Dell, call it what you want. And you can see we're now in 2013, have really reached kind of the maximum hype cycle of BYOD. And so when you see trends like that, it means that it's become kind of universal. Suddenly, it's not just you have to worry about it. Everyone's coming to, to your, your company, your enterprise, your organization, your school, your hospital with their own devices. And at some point, IT has to react by developing policies that will enable access 
and balance that against uh, the security needs that the CIO is very concerned about. So this just means we're redefining our workspace a little bit. This, this has happened in the past, right? It happened when laptops came out originally. People would bring laptops, when laptops first became affordable, they'd bring them to, to the organization and say, I want to get on the network. Nobody could solve the security problem at that time. So what did people do? They set up a separate DMZ zone and would allow people to, to log into the DMZ through that Wi-Fi network and then VPN into the corporate network. And that way they could firewall off the information, but they, they, they kept the enterprise applications off that device. It was really web access, really access to email and PIM, kind of lower level kinds of functions. But now we're moving from things where we had no connectivity, like we were back in the Avant Go days with Palm Pilots, to always on anywhere. Well, almost always on, almost anywhere. It's not quite ubiquitous. IT would choose and define the IT, the, 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 the PC. They define the image. They define what you had access to. Now it's really a, it's a device that reflects an individual, you know, what they have, what they want to use. How many people have, have iPhones? And how many people have Android devices? It's kind of split, right? I mean, it, it's people have, people have a personal preference, right? They identify with that particular brand, they identify with that particular technology, and that's what they want to use, and that's their preference. And that's why you see people bring in whatever devices they have, and that's what they know and understand. They are the support organization for that, them and their immediate community or their online community. And so that's what they want to use within the organization. Your primary device used to be fixed, right? It used to be tethered to, to a, a one megabit line. Now you're tethered to a 100 megabit line. Now your primary device is probably mobile. Uh, you had one device with kind of multiple tasks. Now you have many devices and many tasks. What, what we find is that the mobile population, the people who are using mobile devices, are about a third of the people in any typical organization. They're kind of out in the field. They're sales folks. They're logistics folks. Uh, they're doing calls on patients or individuals, but each one of those individuals probably has one, two, maybe even up to three mobile devices. They'll have a laptop, they'll have a cell phone, they might have a pad type device. And if they have three, that means a third of the people have three devices. So your population of people that you're managing with fixed assets like desktops or, or laptops that are fixed within the environment is about the same number of devices that you'll have to manage in a mobile world. So it's kind of a one-to-one -one, uh, ratio. If you, have 100, if you have 100 fixed computers, you'll probably have 100 mobile devices you're going to have to manage as well. So finally, you've got management security, was all happened inside the firewall, and now you've got management security maybe outside the firewall. And so you need to develop kind of a layered approach to security to ensure that you can capture those things. So here's, here's, here's the issue, right? Users are going to find a way around this. 21% of users have a problem with, uh, with uh, their devices. 10% of them are lost and 10% are stolen. I don't know how you define the difference between those two, but about 20% of mobile devices somehow disappear, right? We all remember the famous story of somebody left an iPhone 5 in a bar in Redwood City and caused a big hoopla it was the front page of the headlines when that first came out. Very embarrassing when those things happen. What's worse is if they are left open, right? So it's important to enforce a policy where if someone's gonna access sensitive data, it needs to be secured in one way or another to ensure that that data doesn't go anywhere. Seven of 10 employees admitted to knowingly breaking IT policies on a regular basis, not just occasionally, but on a regular basis. If you want to get your job done, you might have to go around things. If you want to get something done quickly, you don't want to wait for IT and, and submit a ticket, wait three days for their SLA, they get back to you at the ticket to give you permission to access something, you will find a way around that. And three out of five employees believe, and this is where Emma comes in, she doesn't believe she's responsible for protecting corporate data or devices. She loses her phone, eh, I'll buy another one. I have insurance through AT&T, they'll, they'll give me a new phone for 50 bucks and I'll just get that new phone, right? She doesn't care, right? They, this is, this is the, the biggest concern about security is people will find a way around that. So you need to make sure that you develop a layered approach to where that doesn't happen to you. We do a number of surveys throughout the year of basically IT managers, our audience tends to be IT managers managing uh, desktops, laptops, as well as servers. And we asked them, you know, as you move into this new world, you know, what aspects of mobile devices do you, uh, that employees use do you want to manage? And number one has always been security, right? So that is the, the, the basis of kind of mobile device management. Enforce policies on that particular device. Make sure they have lock, wipe capabilities. Uh, enforce passwords, et cetera. But as you get uh, further down, you start to get into more mobile application management, and ultimately what you need to think about 
is really user management, right? You don't really want to manage the device as much as you want to manage the applications and the user and give that user access on whatever device they have and whatever device they're using at that particular time, access to the appropriate information that they need to from that particular device. So you start getting to policy management, configuring Wi-Fi, email, et cetera. Uh, tracking and inventory is always very important. Where is it, especially in logistics kinds of, of uh, uh, organizations. Having an app store for corporate apps. So now you get away from the point in laptops. Oftentimes, we'll lock down an image and not allow individuals to have admin rights to that, but they can go to a self-service portal and download an approved application. We want to use that same concept within the mobile world because the mobile world is just another, it's another implementation of operating systems. So why would we change the way that we manage them? Give them access to an application store where they can download an approved application, load that themselves, and not have to call IT or get permission from anyone to access that particular app. Location-based security, manage expenses, lots of other things that people want to talk about. So that kind of sets a story of, of kind of what are the issues we're looking at. So, so how did we get there, right? It really started back in, in 10 years ago, in, in 2003. This is when the very first RIM BlackBerry pagers came out. Uh, the BlackBerry, uh, the BlackBerry as you know, the keyboard came out just about that time or shortly thereafter. I think it was maybe the next year. They started with a very closed environment, much like what Apple has done today, where they controlled everything from the device to the software on the device. They controlled the network because they have their network operation centers. The original ones were up in Canada back to what they call BlackBerry Enterprise servers, which were deployed within the enterprise right next to their Microsoft Windows or eventually Lotus Notes servers that would give them seamless connectivity that could be done in a very secure way using FIPS 140 uh, uh, security implementations from, from the back end server all the way out to the device. And they did that very, very well. The folks who did this were very smart, but they focused only on email. They looked at every email as a unit of charge within the battery. RIM's design philosophy. And so they optimized the transmission of, that, of those email bits based on battery consumption. And so that's why when they came out, phones were still getting you know, one or two hours of talk time, and it'd be like, oh, you get eight hours of standby time, right? We were really excited when we had that, and the battery was very thick. The Blackberries came out, they could go for a week, right? And they had good talk time, great data time, great, uh, great security between end to end, and it was kind of a magical device. And so everybody adopted the RIM device. What they hadn't done is looked at the entire ecosystem, right? They just looked at email and PIM. They just looked at corporate applications. And, and they were the first mover. I, I'm, I'm not faulting them or, or degrading anything that they've done. I think I really am, I admire the work that they did. But it was very focused on, on the corporation. Oops, and something happened in 2007, right? That's when the iPhone came out. They took a very different approach to what, are, what defines a mobile device. Right? So they took an approach where they focused on the consumer, not on the enterprise. They focused on music everywhere, music anytime, and that evolved to applications. Uh, email was kind of a natural extension of that, but it was kind of a second thought, right? Apple did not really think about enterprise applications. That was never their intent, was to support the enterprise. So then they focused secondarily on developers and provided an open API so developers could now develop applications just unleashing the world for application stores. BlackBerry and the RIM folks never did that. They intended to have a very closed, very locked down environment that was extremely secure and that was their strength. It also made it their weakness because now nobody else could develop applications in the RIM space. So now they've got you know, 10,000 uh, iOS APIs, you've got a million iOS apps, they've just shipped their billionth or 10 billionth apps, some ridiculous number of applications they've downloaded, right? It's become a tremendous asset for, for Apple. And now in the enterprise, the enterprise is following this because now they see the ubiquity of the devices because half of you have decided to, to pick up uh, Apple, Apple iOS and they bring them into the enterprise. First they brought in their Mac, MacBook Airs, which are very light, very fast laptops. The executive suite would do that, forcing IT to respond to that. Then everybody else started bringing in uh, iPhones forcing IT to respond to that as well. So what happened? This kind of commoditized the whole concept of what mobile device management is. Mobile device management in its basic form is a software function that allows me to control those APIs that have been exposed by the operating system, and that's either iOS or Android. Right? RIM, I think, has 250 
policies that you can configure. Apple hadn't really planned on this. They have about 140 functions or policies that you can configure, and Android, I think, is somewhere in the 200-ish or 250 range. But those are the only policies that we as IT have control over, right? We can't invent new ones. Those are the only ones that have APIs exposed. So what that meant is that we all, ex all control the same functions on those devices, right? I can't do anything different than the other 100 companies out there that are managing doing mobile device management. So as a result, we all have to move up that stack away from just managing those policies that everybody can manage to adding additional capabilities within applications. So application management, security management, and finally user and user setting and user persona management is where this is headed. And that's the only way these different companies can really differentiate themselves. Right now, uh, Apple dominates the world in, in tablets, not necessarily in phones, right? You talked, uh, uh, I believe, briefly, Android phones outshipped Apple phones, I think, last month or the month before last. But Apple and iOS has become the standard in tablets because it's an upgradable technology. Every Apple device has a connector in the exact same place. It uses the same connector. Well, they have two connectors now. But it's in the middle bottom of every one of their devices. It's, it's a standard, standard port, and they use an operating system that can be upgraded and across all devices. And that's kind of the benefit of their closed ecosystem. Android doesn't have that benefit. You buy something with an Android ice cream sandwich on it, you can't upgrade it to the next version of Android because they violated the rule that you have to have standardization across the hardware platform to enable the users to upgrade their software freely without making a lot of special modifications. So as a result, you're seeing much bigger adoption of Apple as a tablet computing platform in the enterprise. Because of that consistency and standardization, and the, and the manageability it implies, then you're seeing with, with Android tablets. Phones are a whole different, whole different ball game, right? In phones, people are buying Android phones. You're seeing Android phones are starting to ship equivalent amounts or more, and I would expect to see Android phones to outship Apple phones in the future. And they don't, ha they don't need that standardization because they're never going to be under the control of enterprise. Enterprises aren't going to adopt them, right? With Apple, what, American Airlines and Apple and uh, United Airlines have both adopted Apples for flight plans, right? They reduced the bulky uh, briefcases that pilots used to bring on with all the maps. They're now on, on iPad devices because they're easy to update, easy to use. That's probably not going to happen in, uh, in the Android world. But in terms of uh, phones, Android, I'm sure, I'm sure will be a, a credible competitor to them going forward. Uh, Windows 8, uh, Windows 7 is starting to come up along with the Windows 8 phones. We'll start seeing those dominate because those are imminently manageable operating systems, right? It's very similar to what's on, well, what's on, on this laptop. Certainly what's going to be similar to what's managed on Windows Server 2012, and you get equivalent manageability across the phones. So you'll see that ecosystem start to develop, but that's going to be much more focused on enterprise devices, I think. Today, you see Windows 8 coming in. IT kind of responds to that, but maybe not necessarily because you don't see anybody migrating from Windows 7 to Windows 8 across large organizations yet. So what happens is those tend to be BYOD phenomena only, right? The only way that you're seeing Windows 8 in, in an organization is someone got it for Christmas, they brought it in and say, hey, I want to use this on, on the network. And IT scratches their head and says, I don't know if we're going to support that this year. Next year we'll do that. Mobile management market is, is maturing. There are 100 companies out there that are offering mobile device management software today, right? Hundred of them, right? There's, uh, the Gartner report on mobile device management is coming out uh, as soon as they finish getting feedback from the individuals that, that contributed that report. I expect that over the next couple of weeks. There's a hundred companies that do this. The, the world market cannot support a hundred companies in this area. So we're starting to see consolidation, whereas at the same time, we're starting to see additional capabilities added to those. So Cisco bought Meraki, uh, Citrix by Zenprise. You're going to start seeing a tremendous consolidation in this market where you'll be adding additional features and additional capabilities that bring, bring them above just the simple device management up to policy application and ultimately, ultimately user management. So where do we want to be, right? And, and what are kind of the emerging mobile security technologies that are available to us today and many of these are offered by you know, companies like, like Dell, but also uh, many of the partners and the vendors that are down in, in the show floor today. So I use this as kind of the virtuous cycle of systems management, right? This is, these are the same functions that are, that are used today by IT that they have to do day to day, regardless of what organization you're in, what school you're in, what hospital you're in, what government uh, agency you're in. 
you've got to image new machines, you've got to deploy new software out to those systems, uh, you've got to move people from an old machine to a new machine, make sure that all of their, their files go along mm -hmm. with them, and you're not going to migrate their, their videos or maybe their music files. Uh, you've got to asset and in inventory those so you can report out on how many systems you have. There's compliance reporting, there's patch management for security. All of these things are done on basically a daily basis. All of those, though, are focused not on the device, but they're focused on the operating system. So that's why I put the operating systems in the middle. And if you do this across Windows, uh, Mac, OS X, any version of uh, Linux, uh, iOS, and Android now, basically the mobile operating systems. So you know, there's form factors on the left-hand side, but my argument is, is those don't really matter, right? That, that's a matter of personal preference. It's a matter of utility. What matters to IT and to setting policies is how, what is your approach going to be to managing these operating systems? And the second thing is iOS and Android represent nothing more than additional operating systems for you to manage. So it's no different than what, you, what we're doing today. The way we're giving access to people to applications and information doesn't change. It's the form factor and those, those key APIs that are exposed within these operating systems that allow us to manage those. So how do, you, how do you approach this, right? We know Emma's come in. We know she's got a tablet. She's got a phone. She hates the laptop you gave her. So how are you going to prevent her from circumventing the security rules that you guys work so hard at establishing so that she can still have access to the data she wants, but you can still maintain security. So what you have to do is kind of have this, this deep level of layered security uh, policies within your organization. So it starts from maybe containerization and encryption, ensuring that the, the data on the device is encrypted at all times. So if that phone or device or laptop is lost, no one can decrypt it, right? You have to have the password. <coughs> Ensure you have a good packet wall that has, you know, stateful packet inspection, right? So that you know what's going across your network and allowing or disallowing devices to access to your network. You can even have them set up so that it can be managed. And if it's managed and has a managing agent on it, you can detect where that agent is on that particular device and then only allow devices that have that managed agent on, on that mobile device or that laptop, only allow those devices access back into, into the corporate network. Uh, operating system optimization, so patching, OS level security solutions like virtualization, containerization are very useful in that area. Monitoring reporting, right, that's our lives, right? Who has, I mean, we live by reports. We live by compliant reports, inventory reports, uh, software usage reports. That's what we live by, right? Ultimately, you have to report on those things. And then network, network devices and network encryption. So let's look at some of these in, in a little more detail. Virtualization. So virtualization has one of the biggest benefits is that the, the data doesn't reside on the particular device. You access it through an application that runs only when you bring it up. You access it maybe through a web service that, that is only uh, that is a non-persistent service. So sensitive data is safe. It's not resident on the device, although virtualization capabilities are, are being developed where you, can, where you can have that persistency on a particular device and there will be some storage on there. Even in web browsers, right, HTML5, is now enabling the capability to start storing data on a particular device. The great thing about virtualization is it enables you to really do user management in a very effective way. Because as a user switches from device to device, uh, that their persona and the policies that apply to that persona can shift with that individual to a different device. So say you have healthcare professionals in a hospital, as they move from terminal to terminal or floor to floor, they can have like an RFID badge that allows them to log on to a terminal instantly and their data then for that particular patient that they're dealing with at that particular time transfers from a terminal to another terminal but follows that user around and displays to them the data they need at the time they need it, right? It's a great security picture. The problem is if you have no offline access. So if they're in a home somewhere, they're doing a home visit, uh, they're someplace where they have limited connectivity or limited bandwidth, that's not gonna work as well and not give them the seamless experience that they're really expecting. So they'll just go back to their mobile device and try and find a way around, around your virtualization policy to go back into the network. But it works very well in a number of situ situations. Uh, there's a lot of different types of virtualization technologies for kind of just desktop virtualization. There's application virtualization where you can, just, you can virtualize just a single application. We find that's the way that most people are working with mobile apps today. You don't see a lot of mobile app stores. But you do see a lot of applications that are already virtualized that then you can take advantage of. And if you only have a few apps that your mobile, uh, your mobile employees want to use, 
that might be a very good way to go. Start, start with a virtualization platform. Containerization is another way. So containerization is, is a step deeper. And this gives you the ability to have an application persistent on a device. You can download an app and have an encrypted container uh, on that device that then the, de the, the data requires, that, that application requires a separate login from the device. The data is encrypted, so it's a very secure way to, to have people interact with data on devices that are mobile, right? The corporate data is protected. Uh, data is access, it's instant access, it's always with you. You don't have to have connectivity, so that's the real benefit of this compared to virtualization technology. You have offline access, so you can access it anywhere at any time because it's always on your device. And it, 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 it works very well. The problem is it's an in, in, the installation process is somewhat slow. That means you probably have to bring your device back to IT and have them provision that out to you possibly, but maybe not with the app stores. Uh, we may be able to get around that very easily. Uh, decryption slows down the data access, but devices are getting much faster and much more powerful. So that decryption step is, is, is speeding up and not taking up as much time. So we're starting to see this happen more and more with, I think, m uh, data that's much more sensitive. So at Dell, we use a, a containerized email app. So we log, I log into my personal cell phone, I have my personal data, but my business data is contained and containerized within this, this email app that I have to log into separately with an entirely different password uh, that is provisioned to me by, by the corporation. Uh, finally, you can start looking at you know, really personas, right? There's firewall technology uh, that will allow access in and out. In a typical phone, you'll have, if you look on the left there, there'll be consumer applications that people will use. That'll be their Facebook account, their Pandora account, their music account, whatever. And then on top of that, you can have a guest operating system. So a guest operating system is like a containerized operating system. So instead of containerizing just an individual app, you now have a container for the entire operating system. You log into that operating system and that gives you access to the enterprise data, to the, to the secure data that you want to keep uh, private and encrypted. So this is an emerging method. I haven't seen too many examples of this yet, but I know this is an emerging uh, point of technology that I think we'll see more and more of because this now gives the individual complete control over their device, complete control over their data, and gives the uh, IT complete control over their partition of the data that's also on that device. Because you have to be concerned about privacy policies, right? You can't, if you want to do an enterprise wipe, you can wipe someone's device, but in certain countries, that's not really very legal. You, you don't have that control or that authority to wipe out someone's device. You want to have the authority and control to wipe out the data that belongs to you within your organization, but not touch their personal data. And this is one good way around that. It's a very, very contained sandbox operating system that, that you can have control over. So other challenges are basically, you know, basically most, most devices aren't really enterprise ready, right? The, the, the ones they're bringing in today, uh, Dell, HP, Asus, a lot of others are now developing enterprise specific type devices that can be easily managed. And I was certainly, Dell is focusing on a lot, lot of laptops that will be running uh, x86 processors, running full versions of Windows, and managing Windows on a laptop is no different, on a laptop is no different than managing Windows, that same version of Windows, on a tablet or potentially that same version of Windows on a phone or some other mobile device. It's, and that's the, the problem we're trying to address is how do we manage all those OSs across different form factors. Lots of inconsistencies between mobile devices. Uh, and this is highlighted by the problem with uh, Android where every Android tablet you have has a customized version of Android on it. So it makes it very difficult to come up with a consistent policy to manage Android devices across, across the wide variety that are, that are made by manufacturers today. And these MDM solutions are, are still maturing, although I think we're kind of at the point where they've, they've matured fairly well and the industry is going to start consolidating very quickly where you have a few vendors uh, that will do uh, things consistently uh, across, across all their devices. And, th and I think that's what we believe and, I, and that's what Gartner also states is that there will ultimately not be a separate Gartner Magic Quadrant or a separate organization that's just mobile management. That will sediment into the IT groups that is managing laptops, desktops, and servers today. Right? You're managing OSs, two new OSs, why are you going to hire new people to do that? A lot of discussion about whether this has to be done on-premise or software as a service, especially for mobile devices. There's some benefits on each. Um, on-premise, you probably have a more complete solution because it sediments into the solution you have today for managing the rest of your assets. 
Uh, SAS is very nice because it's fast deployment. Uh, the payloads that you have for mobile devices, the downloads of patches and things, are much less. They're smaller, so that means they're not going to take up as much bandwidth as you would for uh, updating, say, a Windows or an Apple laptop. Access, access speeds, costs are spread across. Uh, cost is really the biggest one spreading that across, making uh, your mobile device management solution not necessarily a capital intensive project, but making it uh, OPEX. But what you find ultimately in the SaaS systems is that those OPEX expenses ultimately outpace what your, what your capital expenses would have been over a fairly short period of time. Within a year or two, if you're going to keep it for more than a couple of years, you might as well buy it and keep it, not, not do SaaS. No clear preference. So we asked, uh, again, uh, in 2012, our kind of IT audience, you know, how would you, how would you take mobile management software, and how would you like to deploy that? 11% said SaaS, 9% it said appliance, which is really on-premise software, another 20% said on-premise software, but about 60% said, eh, I don't know, don't, don't understand it well enough, don't really care about the deployment methodology, but they know, but they, know they need it. So, so it's unsure where that mix is going to uh, end up, but there'll be room for business models on both sides, either on-premise or as software as a service. Enterprise app stores, I think, are really the next thing. That's what we'll see uh, happen this year, is people are starting to write applications that are specific for their needs. Last year was about email and PIM. The last 10 years was about email and PIM. People were just getting access on their mobile devices to the kinds of information they needed that, at that time to help them. App stores are gonna be the next big thing. So 14% of companies have an app store today. You'll see that rise uh, throughout the year as app stores become more prevalent, and those will be available from lots of different organizations, in including ours. Which group is gonna manage the, the mobile devices? If you had, in, in, you had telecom, originally did a lot of the management, but that was driven by BlackBerry and the BlackBerry Enterprise server, right? That had to be managed by IT. It was a special management function, so that was managed by this telco group that people put together. In some organizations, people manage that through <coughs> security, because they consider it a, a particular unique security threat. And so they want to manage uh, through their security organization, although we see that from the surveys we've taken as maybe five or 10%. That, that's a pretty small minority of organizations are managing mobile devices through that security place. Where we see it sedimenting again, as I said before, is within the systems manage group that already exists within your organization, right? Those same people are managing devices every day, give them a couple more devices, it may double the device load, as I said, right? If, if you have 100 people you're managing today, you'll have 100 mobile devices. So you may double the amount of devices you have to manage, but you can probably do that pretty efficiency with automation, right? Buying software, extending the software you have today that extends current technology and management out to managing iOS and Android type devices. And, and this is just more survey data kind of confirming that, that the 3% the, the said security, a few people said through phones, but the vast majority said when as mobile device management and policy setting needs to be enforced, that'll be done through, through the existing IT organization. So the key to this is, you know, I guess the things I wanna leave you with is we don't know what devices are gonna look like in the future. 10 years ago, we didn't have an iPhone. 10 years ago, the, the first Blackberries kind of came out. 10 years from now, we don't know what the device is gonna look like. They've just announced Google Glass, right? So you can now wear, you now have a wearable computer that gives you a display that you can start looking at and kind of view the world around you. And West Virginia has, has appropriately responded by passing a law or attempting to pass a law outlawing Google Glass, right? That's kind of crazy, right? It's like, it's a technology that's a point in time. We know that's gonna change dramatically. And here they're focusing their time on trying to outlaw this particular technology. What, 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 what I want you to think about is you need to focus on is the operating system. Google Glass is not gonna run an operating system any different than the other Android devices, right? iOS devices are still gonna run, they'll look differently, they may be bigger, they may be smaller, uh, they might be different colors, right? They may personalize the different devices, they're still running iOS. Windows devices will come out with Windows 8. Windows 8 will eventually become a prominent operating system within, within organizations, right? We don't know what that's gonna look like, but we know, we know what Windows 8 is. So I think for 10 years from now, we have a very good idea on what operating systems we're gonna have to deal with and how we're gonna have to manage those. So I think the focus needs to be on operating system management and security. Secondly, Emma's gonna come in, you're gonna hire these 21, 22, 23 year olds, 
and they're going to say, I want, I want you to take care of this device, and if you don't do it the way I want to do it, I'm going to find a way around your security policy. So it's important to make sure you have a layered security approach, especially in the case of mobile devices, so that you can prevent them from circumventing all of them. They can probably get around one, maybe two, but they can't get around six, seven layers of security, right? You guys are smart enough to know how to do that, but it's important to plan for that now, because that's going to be the biggest issue going forward. Because I read something today, it said in 2014, 2015, there'll be more shiplet, shipments of tablet computers than there will be of kind of desktop and, and laptop type computers, right? So you know it's going to be mobile, you know it's coming, you have to plan for it now and start moving forward. Um, and so with that, I'll uh, open up to questions, although I know he's given me very, very little time going forward. Yeah. Sure. Maybe. So location-based security in this context is more around uh, geofencing. So geofencing, uh, on this slide? Yeah, location-based security policy matters. So that's around geofencing. So if, say, a really good example of this are logistics companies, right? If you want someone who has to deliver things or pick up things or do something with a specific geographic area, they have a need and have, have a need to access data within this particular zone. So you can set up what we call geofences today, and, and basically if they go outside a particular location, you can prevent or deny access to a particular application at that time. You could even go as far as say, if set a policy that says, if you go beyond uh, this particular area, we'll wipe your device, because we think if that happens, your device has been stolen or compromised, and we want to prevent that and secure our data. So we will set up a geofence and set up a policy based on that geofence to define the actions that happen on the device. I mean, you can do that now today to a certain extent with phones where, you know, I have a location-based notes on the iPhone where I set it like when I get to, when I leave work, you know, pick up milk. So it reminds me on the way home I have to go by the store and pick up milk and it, it beeps incessantly until I actually tell it to stop or buy milk. But you can imagine wiping data or assuming something's stolen if it goes out some, a particular area. I think most, uh, I can't speak for all, for all 100 companies that, that have that capability, but I know, you know what we have, you know, and I know what, what Apple and Android expose, is, is you can wipe out a data and do a factory reset. So a factory reset means it takes all the applications, all the data, wipes that, and brings it back to an original factory mode. Right. We set, and, I'm, and this is, I'm sure this is very typical, we provision an agent to a device, and that agent determines the configuration and the applications that are on that device that have come from an organization. And so we can send a command to say, uh, wipe the enterprise data from that device, and that agent will then remove just that corporate data from the device. If the individual takes, and takes it in their own hands to go in the operating system and remove that agent themselves, by removing that agent, that will also remove all the corporate data uh, on that particular device. The rest of the device is left alone. So that's that separation, that, that, that firewall between their personal data and the corporate data. As long as they don't move anything outside of that container. As long as they don't move, yes, exactly, exactly. Containerization is a little different where containerization is a containerized app, right? So wipe is a policy applied to a device. Containerization is a policy divide to a, to a particular application. So if that's encrypted and you remove that app or you send a command to, to remove that app, then that data is wiped out as well. Key to this is enforcing, you know, the, the number one is just enforcing passwords, right? The smart thing. Most people just don't password protect their phones. Uh, and so enforcing that with a password of at least you know, five characters rather than four characters really goes a long way to, to preventing loss of data and preventing concerns. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for your time. If you have more questions, we have a booth. We're in the Dell booth downstairs towards the front. Thanks very much.